Hello. In this presentation, I'll give a flavour of potential opportunities for photoplethysmography in public health. Cardiovascular disease accounts for over a quarter of deaths in the UK. During this talk alone, it will cause three hospital admissions, five deaths, and result in £250,000 in healthcare costs. The widespread use of wearables provides opportunity to assess cardiovascular health in daily life and potentially reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease. Indeed, it's expected that this year there will be over 1 billion wearables globally. Wearables, such as this fitness tracker, use photoplethysmography to provide a wealth of information on the heart, blood vessels and cardiovascular health. Potentially, photoplethysmography based wearables could be used to identify cardiovascular diseases earlier than in current clinical practice and to help users manage their health. To introduce myself, my name is Peter Charlton and I'm a researcher at the University of Cambridge and at City, University of London. I work alongside clinical colleagues, such as at St Thomas's Hospital, shown here, to develop signal processing techniques for wearables, which could be used for clinical decision making. In this talk, I'll provide an overview of the most promising opportunities to use photoplethysmography in public health. I'll introduce photoplethysmography, covering the physiological and technical fundamentals. I'll then discuss potential clinical applications, drawing on real life examples of how they could be used to improve health outcomes. Finally, I'll highlight pressing directions for future research to ensure photoplethysmography can be used to inform clinical decisions safely and robustly. Firstly, the fundamentals of photoplethysmography. The development of photoplethysmography devices has taken place in two arenas, clinical and consumer settings. Photoplethysmography was developed in the 1930s. Researchers quickly realised that the shape of the pulse wave provides much information on cardiovascular health and differs between healthy and diseased subjects. It wasn't until almost a, cent a half a century later that photoplethysmography entered clinical use. It became widely used for oxygen saturation monitoring in operating theatres and on intensive care units within pulse oximeters. Over the next two decades, pulse oximetry became widely used in a range of healthcare settings, from hospital wards to primary care. Recently, it's been recommended for home use in the COVID-19 pandemic. In the early 2010s, wrist-worn photoplethysmography devices, which could monitor heart rate, became available to consumers. They have since developed to provide several additional measurements. Let's take a closer look at the technology. The photoplethysmogram, or PPG for short, is widely measured by pulse oximeters to measure oxygen saturation and by consumer devices such as fitness trackers, smartwatches and smart rings. It exhibits a pulse wave for each heartbeat and so is used to monitor heart rate. It can also be used to provide insights into heart rhythm as the beat to beat intervals can be used to distinguish between a normal regular rhythm and an abnormal irregular rhythm. The shape of individual pulse waves contains information on the heart and blood vessels with marked differences between young and elderly subjects. There are also slower fluctuations which can be used to monitor breathing. Of course, there are great challenges to analysing the PPG, including handling motion artefact. The use of photoplethysmography in wearables presents opportunities to monitor health in daily life, including identifying atrial fibrillation, an arrhythmia, which increases the risk of stroke, assessing blood pressure and vascular health, and monitoring breathing, a key marker of clinical deterioration. I'll now introduce potential clinical applications. 
So, opportunities for photoplethysmography in public health. Perhaps the most advanced application of wearable photoplethysmography is detecting atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is the most common abnormal heart rhythm and it increases the risk of stroke by fivefold. If it was adequately treated in England, then it's estimated that 2,000 lives would be saved per year, 7,000 strokes would be prevented, and an additional 425,000 diagnoses would be made. Atrial fibrillation is often not recognised because it can occur intermittently and without symptoms. Persistent atrial fibrillation, which occurs all the time, would be picked up on in a standard ECG assessment. However, atrial fibrillation is often paroxysmal, occurring only intermittently, meaning it could be missed at an assessment. It can also occur without symptoms, meaning a test might not be indicated. Wearables provide opportunity to monitor the heart rhythm continuously, potentially helping identify even infrequent episodes of atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation can be identified from the PPG signal by assessing the regularity of beat-to-beat -beat intervals. In a normal rhythm, the beat-to-beat -beat intervals are fairly consistent. In contrast, in atrial fibrillation, the beat-to-beat -beat intervals are irregular. Potentially, a consumer wearable could be used to identify possible atrial fibrillation episodes in this manner. Indeed, the potential utility of an Apple Watch to identify atrial fibrillation was assessed in the Apple Heart Study in over 400,000 individuals. Key results included a reassuringly low alert rate, a high positive predictive value of alerts, and a much longer monitoring time than could be achieved at scale in clinical practice. In this study, possible episode of atrial fibrillation prompted further monitoring using the gold standard of an ECG-based wearable in order to confirm a diagnosis. The Fitbit Heart Study has since reported its results, also recruiting over 400,000 individuals and producing a low alert rate and a high positive predictive value. The recent addition of ECG sensors to wrist-worn wearables means that potentially they could be used to not only identify possible atrial fibrillation, but also to prompt the user to take an ECG measurement, which could be clinically reviewed to confirm a diagnosis. At the University of Cambridge, we are investigating the performance and acceptability of wearables for detecting atrial fibrillation in the SAFER wearables study. This study will enrol older adults aged 65 and over half of whom have atrial fibrillation. Participants will be asked to wear two wrist-worn devices, an ECG device and a PPG device, alongside an ECG chest patch, which will provide reference labels of atrial fibrillation. This study will run over the next couple of years and will provide valuable evidence on the use of wearables in older adults who are at higher risk of atrial fibrillation than the general population and it will also take place in the target setting, at home, in daily life. Another promising application is identifying obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea is a sleep disorder in which breathing stops due to airway collapse. It's estimated that almost 1 billion people worldwide are affected by obstructive sleep apnea. Untreated obstructive sleep apnea increases the risk of cardiovascular events. It's thought that the majority of people with it are undiagnosed, partly due to the need for sleep tests in a laboratory for definitive diagnosis. Pulse oximetry is already used as part of sleep tests. Wearables provide opportunity to obtain these data unobtrusively in daily life and could potentially be used to detect obstructive sleep apnea. Indeed, evidence is emerging 
indicating that wearables could be used to screen for obstructive sleep apnea, with a comparable accuracy to clinical screening. A key step now is to ensure that oxygen saturation monitoring in wearables is sufficiently accurate to identify obstructive sleep apnea. In the future, fitness trackers could be used to monitor the spread of infectious diseases in society and even identify symptoms in individuals. Information on the spread of infectious diseases can be used to direct healthcare resources, plan public health interventions and potentially even provide early warning to individuals that they may be infected. Recently, the potential benefits of using Fitbit data to track influenza-like illness were assessed, using at least 60 days of data from almost 50,000 people in the US. An elevated resting heart rate and increased sleep duration were used as markers of disease. The study found that the inclusion of Fitbit data improved the performance of disease prediction models, which could help ensure timely responses to reduce further transmission. The potential benefits of wearables for identifying COVID-19 have also been assessed. The inclusion of data from consumer wearables in COVID-19 detection models has been found to improve performance beyond that of using symptom app data alone. Several parameters were used in these studies relating to heart rate, sleep and activity. In the future, early warning systems could integrate wearable data self-reported symptoms and electronic health record data, providing both population level and individual level surveillance. In the future, fitness trackers could also be used for cardiovascular risk assessment. Blood pressure monitoring would be perhaps the most exciting addition to wearable photoplethysmography devices. A few years ago, many, many wristbands provided blood pressure monitoring although none were found to be validated. Since then, some wristbands have been validated and approved, although recent guidelines advise against their use, and a new standard has been developed with which to validate them. One potential application of blood pressure monitoring would be to continuously check for signs of preeclampsia in pregnancy. Technology has also been developed to use photoplethysmography to assess vascular age, the biological age of the arteries, which is indicative of cardiovascular risk. Photoplethysmography measurements provided by wearables could be used to assess arteriosclerosis, the natural stiffening of the arteries with age. Clinical devices have been developed which use photoplethysmography to assess atherosclerosis, the build-up of plaque, which is a common cause of peripheral vascular disease. Finally, it's well known that the rate at which the heart rate recovers after exercise is indicative of cardiovascular risk. Wearables provide opportunity to assess this in daily life, rather than only in clinical settings. Furthermore, recent work has demonstrated the potential utility of wearables for identifying periods of walking in daily life, which could provide a basis for assessing cardiovascular health in a similar way to the six minute walk tests currently performed in clinical settings. Hence, there is great potential for photoplethysmography to aid cardiovascular risk assessment, although much of this is still in development. So, areas for future research to realize the potential of photoplethysmography in public health. Firstly, devices will continue to be optimised to provide the best possible signals for analysis. Particular challenges include obtaining high quality signals during movement and accounting for the effect of contact pressure on measurements. Secondly, signal processing algorithms must be robust to provide accurate and precise parameters. I've mentioned blood pressure in this presentation and oxygen saturation is another parameter which must meet acceptable standards. Thirdly, analytical techniques must provide clinically useful information. For instance, in the Apple Heart study, notifications of an irregular pulse were only raised if at least five out of six consecutive measurements exhibited an irregular pulse, thereby reducing the false alert rate. 
Fourthly, devices need to be tailored towards the target users, particularly as those who may benefit most from wearable monitoring are not necessarily those who currently use wearables most. We need to understand what motivates people to use wearables and ensure they're designed appropriately. Finally, and most importantly, specific clinical applications should be identified in which wearables could contribute to improved patient outcomes. Usually, such applications involve either identifying an under-recognised disease or providing monitoring in a setting where it would otherwise be impractical. To conclude, there is great opportunity to use photoplethysmography in public health. Clinical applications are emerging, including detecting atrial fibrillation. And when used clinically, photoplethysmography should be like a climbing rope. It should be highly reliable, validated, and used for specific purposes. Of course, you can't do justice to the potential of photoplethysmography in just 15 minutes. For more information, see my website and our review of wearable photoplethysmography for cardiovascular monitoring. Thanks for listening.